Okay, and welcome back. Hour number two already, zooming right along. We have a guest uh, going to join us this hour. We're going to learn some things, and we have been, as you know, for many years, most specifically eight and a half years. It'll be nine years this next March. Talking about Fukushima, what the radiation has done to the entire northern hemisphere, not just North America. It circles the globe and it has been around the world, this radiation, God knows how many thousands of times since Fukushima. So we have more evidence, and I want to tip my hat to Dana Durnford, of course, up there in, in Canada, British Columbia, who has been doing so much to bring the light of reality to the issue of extinction, bugs and birds. And if you look on the right-hand side, down in featured stories, you'll see the Fukushima box, and you'll see the Bugs and Birds archive. And if you have any observations in your area and you'd like to share them, just go look down there and send us an email telling us what you see, what's changed in your view about bugs, birds, animals in general. Uh, it can be anything. I've noticed a change in, in some of the plants. Uh, there's something called gigantism which is brought about by radiation. And I have absolutely seen evidences of gigantism uh, on, on my property. Uh, wild mustard, normally about two, two and a half feet tall, eight, nine feet tall. Gigantism. Um, just no joke. Todd Hunter Folk is with us this hour, F-O-U-L-K. Todd uh, is a resident he lives uh, near Portland, Oregon, uh, east of it. He sent me a very interesting email, and uh, I'm not but four and a half hours away from five hours from where Todd is, and I've seen many of the same things. He's noticed this trend you know, even before Fukushima, though, but I'm sure he would probably agree that it has accelerated dramatically since uh, Fukushima blew, and boy, did it ever. Todd, thanks for being here. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Mr. Entz. Thanks to the listeners as well. And I'll tip my hat as well to those who have written in with their observations. That's actually what uh, the genesis of my uh, report emailed to you as well. So tip my hat to all those people out there as well. Yeah. And let's, uh, I mentioned Dana and, of course, the number one, the go-to guy that we all know is uh, Yoichi Shimatsu. Yoichi is... Uh, one of the world's greatest environmental uh, researchers, writers, uh, activists, proponent. He is absolutely brilliant. He writes about many different subjects, not just radioactivity and extinction. But uh, Dana is, is put his life on the line up there and made all those trips up and down the B.C. coast to the islands to check, take photographs, make videos. Uh, just uh, extraordinary. And, and I don't know how it is where you are, but one of the big giveaways for me was a number of years ago when I noticed that during the summertime, Todd, no, no bug splats on the windshield to speak of or the front of the car it used to be unbelievable every year. And then it just got to be less and less. And, and now you can go for weeks and not have to wipe off your windshield. If that doesn't tell you something, nothing will. How is it up there? I'm a 55 year old man, you know, fifth generation Oregonian, uh, county in my whole life. Those who know uh -huh. Portland are aware of the term East County, but I'm out here at the mouth of the Columbia River Gorge, about 15 miles west of Portland. But, uh, my great grandparents, they lived in the, on the Halem Bay in Wheeler, Oregon. And when we would take the, you know, the annual summer trips back and forth to visit them, uh, basically we would count the bug splats. Uh, you know, you all, and we had a Volkswagen van with the big, you know, rounded oh, front yeah. ends. Oh, sure. yeah, sir. Yeah, so we were pretty good at collecting bugs in that regard, but I, nothing, nothing now. My daughter, who happens to live um, in Scapoos, about, you know, 20 miles northwest of Portland, you have to drive by the huge Savia Island Wildlife Refuge, and that's pretty much, you know, there's nothing out there. 
you know, a few houses, of course, and then Scappoo's at the other end of it. But yeah. even 20-something years ago, making the trip between uh, Scappoo's and Trout, where I reside, I, you know, it's the same thing. And now, I think, coming back from her house today, I saw one bug hit the windshield. I did, and it was noticeable, whereas before, it was yeah. kind of like driving yeah. through hyperspace on Star Wars or something, you know. That's a good analogy. As a mental picture is about right. I mean, it was common just to have hundreds and hundreds, maybe even more, and you'd have to really work to get some of that stuff off. Uh, it didn't come off easy. Uh, and then we have Gary Holland, of course, living in Las Vegas. I think he made six trips. You can see it down there on the right-hand side under bugs and birds. He made six trips to L.A. from Las Vegas, and... Uh, uh, he never cleaned his the front of his car. He didn't have to. It Six looks pristine. You just ran that story. I was looking at that the other day. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it's going on in more places than people would ever realize, and that's why I urge people to go read those stories. I can't remember how many I've had of people in the Midwest or the South who have farm lights, for example, or an outside light at night. And in the summertime, it would look like a rainstorm of bugs swirling around it. And they tell me 10, 15 insects. That's it now. Gone. This is enormous. And no one's talking about it. Whoop, you still just shaded out a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And I was okay, just saying, no one is talking about it anymore. They just, they've noted it and I, they just, they accept it now. Now it's the norm all of a sudden. That's what people do now. They'll adopt something completely crazy as the norm without any real resistance. They just accept it. Here's, here's, the, uh, here's the email that Todd Folk sent me, and I'd, I'd like just to read this, Todd, and I'll stop and have you fill in some of the blanks and elaborate if you want to. Um, and this just is kind of a, a tutorial for those who might want to write. You don't have to be this elaborate can be two sentences. I don't care. I just want to know what's going on in your area so we can post it and let people know out there that they're not alone if they're seeing a lack of bugs, insects, birds, animals, you name it, normalcy. He wrote, uh, Hi Jeff, I live east of Portland, Oregon, about 15 miles at the mouth of the gorgeous Columbia River Gorge. I have lived in the same house for 45 years now, and when I was young, I saw huge flocks of starlings, blackbirds, and robins in the thousands. Their wing beats from a half mile away were audible, and as I have been a fisheries biologist responsible for counting tens of thousands of salmon smolts at a time, my figuring is pretty good. So if memory serves me correctly, there may have been up to 10,000 birds in some of those flocks. They would fly through our area from late September through mid-October, and you sure didn't want a flock of that size to fly over your head. Um, that was true. Um, they used to come through, and the way those starlings would fly, you know how they'd change direction instantaneously, all of them? And you know they weren't talking to each other. So how did they do it? I mean, it's <laughs> one of those mysteries of nature. So, yeah, when you were a kid, you watched the flocks of birds. Fun stuff. And then, gone. No more. And absolutely right. Um, we had the cowbirds as well, like the brown-headed cowbirds. Those were incredibly thick as well. And I just went down Marine Drive, which is the east-west arterial that border that you know is right along the Columbia River here in Portland, uh, just yesterday. Yeah. And I saw six. I saw six of them. I didn't see, you know, 16,000, but I saw six. So they're not extinct here yet, but my goodness, just the, the dearth of the birds, as you were saying as well with the insects. You know, again, you know, being able to reside in the family house for so long and bringing it down generations, we have a swimming pool in the backyard, and my folks had to get a screen door. You know, they have a neat backyard Dutch door, the old style that opens up on the top. Yeah. And closing on yeah. the bottom, cute little door. Sure. They, they had to cover that door up with a screen because you could not leave that back porch light on and open the top of the Dutch door without, you know, turning your house into an insect swarm. Um, 
you know, and the insect swarm was comprised of at least a dozen species, anything from, you know, the pine boring beetles, um, green lace wings, uh, golly. We, there were hardly any house flies, but we had a lot of different moth species. And now in the summertime, we don't even need to shut the screen door and the Dutch door is open. We don't, you know, get, we don't even get those big gigantoid cool looking crane flies that look like a giant mosquito. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're gone where, too. Where You're are right. Those? Um, everybody has documented the precipitous decline of the bees, but uh, same thing. We used to, you know, we'd catch them like Fred Flintstone in the little clam shells and pretend like we're shaving with them. Now, when I mow my front <laughs> lawn, uh, yeah, when we were kids, of course. That's um, very funny. I've never heard that one. Oh, you, well, it was a Fred Flintstone thing. You know, they'd catch the bees. Yeah, I never watched the Flintstones. Shell. I missed it. So the, you get a clamshell, both sides, and you... you oh, that's funny. I didn't yeah, and we never got stung, but, but uh, no longer are there enough bees. And when I'll mow out front, I've got a neat little patch of clover that'll pop up some four-leaf clover. It's kind of cool, probably genetic. But I'll just skirt the whole clover, you know, two foot wide by 10 or 12 feet long between the curb and my sidewalk just so I leave the bees something to eat. But uh, we have lost so many things, Jeff, up here. You know, the birds, uh, during the fall and spring when they're migrating through, uh, one thing that's completely noticeably absent are the Oregon juncos. You know, the little gray guys with the brownish heads. Cute, cute, cute birds. Yeah, there are no more juncos, Jeff, and they were ubiquitous. I think that they were probably a um, full-time winter resident here as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, where I live, there hasn't really been, uh, I mean, sure, Portland has built out itself, but East County until probably the last two years, some of those multiple thousand acre fields along the Columbia River, um, those are just beginning to build out now, which is a waste of, of unoccupied warehouse space. But um, the, the birds and the animals, you would see that they're thickly gone, just gone, Jeff. It's, it's uh, to those who are aware, it's completely noticeable. To others who probably have their head on, you know, in the NFL or whatever, you know, like you're saying, some people just don't see it. But the insects being gone, even the Pacific tree frogs, in beginning probably late January, you could open uh -huh. up, you know, a window or a door, and, you know, because we're only two miles from the Columbia River, uh, we would hear them all along the sloughs. I mean, it was a cacophony. Sure. You could totally hear those guys. No longer, no longer. Um, and all the different birds that used to fly through here, nothing. You know, the cowbirds by the thousands, the starlings, you know, the by the tens of thousands, and the same with robins. Even to see a flock of 10 or 12 robins going over, that's a big flock now. And right now is the, the, yeah. the ultimate time to see the, the migrations, and it's just not there. I have seen robins come through here maybe a dozen at a time, and that's about it. So you're right on the money. Uh there are so many things going on now with this, this extinction. I, I don't know that it's, it's going to come back. There's something called, that Dana told us first about the quiet forest syndrome. And I think that can be extrapolated to woods, woodlands as well. Uh, you just don't hear nature, noise anymore. Uh, I've got a little bit of land around me. I can walk around and in the daytime, I, I don't hear anything. I don't hear songbirds anymore. They're just gone. And this is something that should be alarming to everyone. And it just seems to be accepted. No, well, that's the norm. That's just the way it is. No, it's not the way it is. Not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, how about in the summer when you stick your head out? And I think it's still warm enough. Maybe not. But I would listen for crickets and I, I often heard none. Zero. It would be quiet at night. And it used to be that there would be a symphony of crickets outside chirping. Yeah, veritable symphony. Yes, but they're gone. Yeah, yes, we don't, and it would the, be huge. It would keep you awake. It kept it kept anymore. me awake. Yeah, yeah. Here's uh, 
Here's some more of Todd's Todd's letter. He writes the big. He's talking about flocks of migratory birds. By the way, you live on a, a migration flight path, don't you? Correct. Yeah. He writes uh, the biggest groups. They're not flocks by any stretch of the imagination any longer, which I now see in our area are groups of maybe 30 or so robins. I, I don't know that I've seen that many. I'd have to think. Maybe, maybe one group. No more blackbirds, and even the invasive starlings are few and far between. When there are flocks, I mean groups of them, the numbers are maybe 50 to 75. Uh, and that's it. Their flocks are no longer large. They're groups. Did I mention I live right in uh, a formerly myriad songbird migration route? What We mentioned songbirds here. What songbirds that you... I used to see orioles down here and red-winged blackbirds, of course, all over the place, but no more. And I don't hear any birds outside. Jaybirds, that's it. Scrub jays, blue jays. They're tough for some reason. Uh, but remember, most birds eat insects. So when the insects go away, guess where the birds go? They go away too. And a lot of them die. No food. Yeah, so what even kind of birds? They're even laying eggs. We don't know. I don't see any evidence of nests anymore like I used to. I used to see, you know, an, an egg would drop from a nest or something or eggshells would come down or you'd find an old bird's nest after the, uh, Eggs at all hatched. No more. I don't see them anymore. Just nothing. No, and I've been an avid bird watcher my whole life. I had a um, biology teaching grandfather who instilled that love in me. But uh, I used to keep like a detailed booklet of what I would see, you know, some field notes. Most of that was into raptors and falcons. But in speaking of the falcons, uh, cruising down Marine Drive today, I saw one sparrowhawk. You know, it was a you know hover kestrel, whatever you want to call it, American kestrel, sparrowhawk, falcos, bavarius. But it was hovering. So I've seen one where generally, I, yeah, I don't know what their ranges are. I don't know how you know the the pairs would overlap. But we always had a resident pair in my neighborhood. No longer. Um, and you know, I have a bird feeder out. I still feed the hummingbirds, which there are hummingbirds. However, there are only the Anna's hummingbird, the little green guy with the you know rubyish throat. The rufous huh. hummingbird, the kind of copper one, they're gone. I haven't seen any ant or any of the rufous hummingbirds for several years, but uh -huh. even the house sparrows. And I think that these are the you know imported European um, house sparrow. But I had a you know multi generational family that lived in the ivy year round. Uh, they did it was a little family. I would you know throw crumbs out and feed them. I you know if you have a crow family that's been around for ten years, I watch the parents uh -huh. have babies. And then the babies get yeah. married when the flocks come through and take off, you know. But uh, even the sparrows are gone. I'm sure they're elsewhere. But, again, where I live, things haven't really changed in several decades. And the big ivy patch up against the house, that was an awesome little domicile for the sparrows. They're gone. They're not around anymore either. And, you know, they're they're an omnivorous critter. But And then here's something else, too. Aphids. I've got 60-year-old rose bushes that you know would uh -huh. get covered in aphids and you know sure. we'd watch the uh the um, old ladybug larva munch down on them with you know um, magnifying glasses as kids there's no more aphids what the heck huh yeah aphids uh, again this is we have to think about the insect world as a food chain and that's a that's a major link for a lot of uh a lot of eating and there's many kind of other weak birds as well when you look at an aphid there's not much to them you know they need the ants to protect them you know that's why they excrete the uh, why god hooked them up with excreting the little you know sweet syrup or whatnot but mm -hmm. um and then speaking of ants we used to have well the carpenter ants nobody wanted to see but uh, and they were few and far between but we had a, a kind of a red you know mid-sized species we had a black mid-sized species then we had like a, a red and black mid-sized species those are gone as well 
um, it's pretty scary rents when you really want to look at things like that. Um, and again, you know, the indicator species, you know, in the food chain, when the weak little aphid goes or the ant goes and no one can, you know, any longer protect the aphid, well, what, what starts going up the food chain from there, you know? So we still see dragonflies, you know, they'll come flying around the pool, but they're it, tough. Can, you know, there being, aren't uh, as many. Fairly absurd. Oh, yeah. Ahead, sorry. They're, they're tough. They've been around since the dinosaurs, as you know, <laughs> along a uh, so of pine trees, but not as many dragonflies. But they're they're still around. They used to be just you could walk on them practically. Now there 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 are a lot of them around, but not and not as many colors as there used to be. So I used to see a lot of different colors: orange, red ones, green, green ones, red, blue ones. Oh yeah, yeah 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 yeah. Yeah, Lots the red ones are neat. But I say really? with the grasshoppers, I don't know what the native species of what, grasshopper what grasshoppers is, but what yeah, grasshoppers? those guys are gone too. Absolutely gone. See, this this is a big problem. And you know what else is gone? Not completely, but virtually nearly gone. Ants. I used to see ants everywhere. Mm-hmm. Carpenter ants, little ants, I uh, forget what they call them, but... And they're, they're nature's janitors, okay? They, they clean things up. But they're gone. Um, don't know. Hold on. We're talking to Todd Folk, and we're going to continue our conversation in just a couple of minutes. Stand by for more. Okay. And we're back. We're uh, taking a look uh, through the eyes and experiences of one of our longtime listeners, to the extinction event that is engrossing the entire Northern Hemisphere and North America. Back to uh, Todd's letter to me, his email, just to give some of you encouragement. Go ahead and write to us. We'd like to know. And if you'd like your name used, we'll put that up. If you don't want, we'll just leave it whatever whatever makes you comfortable. Um, Bees. Uh, No more bees. I'm not talking about honeybees. You mentioned other bees. Uh, Todd writes, And bees, nada, used to have big orange carpenter bees. Honeybees, little black guys who stung really good, mud daubers and the big blue wasps, and the neat bald-faced hornets. All are gone now. So are the butterflies, painted ladies and swallowtails, which used to abound, are also gone so they're gone i remember so many times as a as a youngster seeing just i really like butterflies they were everywhere todd they were all over the place many different species the monarchs you name it they were all there gone yeah we don't didn't really get the monarchs up here but we got just tons of the painted ladies swallowtails were everywhere you could just sit in the backyard and uh, you know on the deck whatever drive your bike delivering your paper house going to your best friend's house it didn't paper matter route. there's another thing by. that's gone let's not forget gone. that paper yeah. routes are gone too <laughs> it's too dangerous for little kids to do that so i don't yeah, i don't do yeah, no, johnny gosh that's all i'm gonna say regarding a paper route that's enough kid. that says it all yeah, my best friend Pete and I, uh, we, you know, we were avid, you know, amateur entomologists, and we would go catch everything. Um, but having a 40 foot long by 18 foot wide swimming pool, that's better than any bug net, let me tell you. And we, you know, we would always <laughs> be fishing bugs off the top when you clean out the filter. Uh, uh-huh. But again, just nothing, and that's just like a big, you know, paper trap. You just catch anything that decides it wants to try and get a sip of water. Or the wind pushed in, but just nothing there too. So it's not just you know my empirical observation or you know myopia that's not letting me see what should be there. It's just like the front end of the vehicles. There's just there's it's just gone. There's just no evidence for it anymore. Um, you were mentioning northern hemisphere. What's it like in the southern hemisphere? Any of your listeners reporting in? Are you hearing anything regarding that? Because I just read the the study online that you've got still up there, one of the fairly recent articles about Germany and the decades-old amateur entomologist um, 
you know, project where they were weighing the biomass, uh, and their right. collection techni- uh, techniques have not varied. It's, they kept some pretty strict scientific protocols in that yes, regard. Yes, they did. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. very interesting read. Very, very. Someone can go hunt that down, run, run the search engine on there. But I suggest if you really want, you know, uh, a, a great read, take that. But what was it? Eighty-three percent biomass down there at like seventeen percent or whatever um, from what there were just a few decades ago. And that's what it looks like up here too. But I, I'd be kind of interested to hear what anybody's talking about. You know, South America. Ask Oates in Australia. See, see what he made. Yeah, I'll I'll do that when I talk to David next. I have not received, boy, something in the back of my mind says I got, I got an email about that from somebody, but I I can't be sure. So I'll have to say at this point, nothing major has been received by me from anybody in, in South America about that. I don't know what the situation is down there, but I I do know the situation up here seems to be ignored by people first of all i guess they have to become aware of it to ignore it but they just accept everything is just accepted it's folded into their life experience well that's just the way it is there are no there are no butterflies around here that's just not the way it is after a couple of years many people will say that there just weren't any here so it's not a big deal but they're gone uh now how about reptiles uh, I saw one garter snake this summer. Don't think I even saw a gopher snake. I didn't see many on the roads, dead, maybe one. And usually you'd see, unfortunately, a lot of dead snakes on the, on, flat snakes on the highway. And they're, they're just not being, they're not there. Um, I used to really like snakes when I was a little kid. We used to collect them and, keep them in little cages and feed them and all that and then turn them loose. But no more. Do you see many roadkill snakes up there? They used to go you out know, and sun themselves on the roads, but not anymore. Yeah, we, we've got a lot of open fields up around here. Um, you know, some of that reclaimed Columbia River when they put the big dike in there on Marine Drive. So that opened up a lot of what would have ah, traditionally been kind of an alluvial yeah. plain and a seasonal part of the river itself. But, like, you know, my best friend Pete and I, when we were kids, we would literally couldn't wait to get out of school so we could run a couple blocks away uh, and go catch snakes. But between the neighborhoods, you know, I mean, you got three or four blocks would separate a neighborhood and maybe one main arterial. But um, we would have competitions to see who would be able to catch the most garter snakes. Uh-huh. And they were everywhere. But a kind of right. an interesting uh, thing was the um, Willamette Valley, uh, outside of basically Lake o- Okeechobee in that area in the Okefenokee Swamps of, you know, southeastern um, right. United States. We had the most biomass of any uh, any play, you know, any geographic location in North America, and it was comprised of Pacific tree frogs, garter snakes, and slugs. Three things you really don't see anymore, and, and truth be known, you really don't see very many slugs either. You just don't. But we had the blue belly, um, oh golly, the blue belly lizards. We had uh, alligator lizards. We had rubber boas. Now those were a little more esoteric, and you had to go a little bit further out. You of had my uh, area. rubber Maybe boas up, five or six up there, miles to catch Todd. Those. Excuse me. You had rubber sure. boas up there. Uh, yeah, we had rubber boas a lot. Um, huh. you know, boring, boring Oregon. Sure, it's been a joke. A lot of people have heard of it. It's you know maybe again fifteen miles south or uh, southeast of Portland proper. Uh, we would catch those by the dozen as well. Probably up to around nineteen seventy eight when we kind of got into girls and bikes and paper routes and things like that. But yeah, we had you know the cute little rubber boas. Uh, we would catch those. We would catch um, the al- western alligator lizards by the dozens. You don't see any of that. The blue bell is eating nothing. Same thing. We have a lot of, or traditionally or formerly had a lot of salamander species, like the uh, Pacific or the uh, Western long-toed salamander. Yeah. You don't find those either. I, I caught one of those about... Ten years ago, at a friend's house who lives further up the Columbia River Gorge, but uh, I and I, I just 
I don't know if it's Fukushima, Jeff. I don't. I can't. I don't know. I haven't studied things enough. But the butterfly crash was a little bit prior to that. Uh, same, I would suspect with the birds. So I don't know if it's kind of the Rachel Carson Silent Spring. You know, DDT's been out of the food chain for a long time, though. I'm sure that you could still test for it and find it in at least a part per billion in some eggshell right. somewhere. Right. But um, I, I don't know. I've seen the tidal pool pictures right after Fukushima. Oh, that's, that's a what a catastrophe. Yelling. No, that's, um, that's, and I'll, I'll tell you, we got this from Dana first about insects being gone. And this was years ago. And it has proliferated all over the country. So there may have been a diminution before. Yes. Uh, whatever was going on before has been eclipsed by the Fukushima aftermath, I think by a factor of, of a hundred. I just, you mentioned Western alligator lizards. And yeah. for those of you who were kids and used to collect alligator lizards, they got to be pretty, pretty big for a little kid's hand. Yeah, they, they were bite very nice. They bite good. They bite good. And, uh, I, I know somebody I knew had one for a pet. And named it Snap. And, uh, it used to hang out on her little baseball type cap. Just on the brim. It would just sit up there all day. And very happy. Really a nice, a nice animal. Um, but th- like you say, you couldn't in the old days go out and turn over a couple of boards without finding at least an alligator lizard and maybe a few skinks and some other things. Yeah, but no more. Skinks. Go, go, go turn over a board now. You won't see anything. Maybe a few earthworms. That's it. A few, a few, uh, uh, the little bugs that roll up in a ball. What are they, what are they called? Oh, yeah, we, yeah, we call them pill bugs. I don't, I'm not sure what they are. We used to call them cellar, cellar bugs, but whatever. Anyhow, those earthworms and maybe a few grubs under a board. That's it. In the old days, Li- alligator lizards all over the place. They eat those things. They just thrived, but they're gone. I mean, I was digging through a wood pile the other day. Nothing. Nothing there. One or two spiders. That's it. So, not, not encouraging. Not good. And let me finish a little bit more of, uh, of Todd's, uh, email here. Uh, he talks about reptiles. Uh, we mentioned that. He said, we do see, and this is a factor, chemtrails by the dozen, especially right after a Pacific high pressure ridge breaks down. And then there is the human litter by the ton, which even in Portland was non-existent from the late 60s until about 2010. Rats, yes, we now have rats everywhere. What the heck is going on? Weird thing. This is a weird one. Uh, well, before I go to the next thing, what about chemtrails? And we know there's heavy metals in there. We know there's nanoparticulates, nanomachines. There could be anything in chemtrails. Do you tie that into this, this uh, extinction event at all? I, I would you know, think just, that you would. You know, yeah, just with empirical data, and I do remember the first chemtrail that I ever saw very well. I uh, just had recent back surgery. I was laying out on the deck looking up. And when we were kids, would we have seen something like that? We would have first thought somebody was sky riding because they used to do sky riding. I don't remember. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but it was kind of neat. You know, Ron Tonkin, Chevrolet, I don't know, somebody put something up there. With there you go. Plane. And you know what they would use to do that? They would use uh, the Stearman biplanes commonly in, in the old days. And then they went to uh, more modern aircraft. But skywriting was a big advertising format, yes. It was fun. Yeah, it was neat. But that first chemtrail, it was probably before they shook the bugs out of the system. And you'd see the the trail. And there'd there'd be kind of a little puff where maybe the aerosol came out, you know, a little thicker. But I really thought that that was the ramjet propulsion because I had just heard of that project. And Uh I ran in the house, grabbed my binocs, and, and I had already missed the airplane that had flown over. But 
right on the heels. Here comes another one. And so I'm scoping that out, and I'm looking at it. I'm like, that just looks like a commercial airliner, I, you know. Uh, and I got 12 by 50 Pinox. They're pretty good. Um, but uh, I couldn't really figure it out, and I don't know if that was around the time I began listening to you uh, with sightings or if one of my other more aware friends told me. But, uh, yeah, chemtrails. And reading what I've read and knowing a little bit about what I know with, like, some of the plethodon and, and whatever species or families of salamanders breathing through their skin, uh, I don't imagine getting your pores clogged up with barium and whatever aluminum that's out there. And actually, as you know, and probably everyone else listens listening, uh, that changed the pH of the soil in Northern California from acid to more of an alkaline base. So it's killing off a lot of the, the more right. sensitive right. plant species as well. But I, 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 unless I were able to do a, like a, a repeatable experiment, regarding the chemtrails and whatever is dying off. I wouldn't want to weigh in, but I could sure as heck say, you know what, about the time those chemtrails showed up, 96, 97-ish, that's about the same time we quit seeing the, you know, I don't know about the songbirds so much, but at least the insects, because like I said, I'm in the same house, same pool, everything. And right. and you used to even be able to look at the street lights, just buzzing around the street lights. Oh, sure. And then the bats, the bats would be flying around, yeah. catching the bugs under the streetlights. No more. Yeah. Yeah, I'm an avid jogger as well, and for about the last decade, I've been I've changed my routine so I jog at night. And there's a school really close to me on my jogging trail or path that I would see probably up until. Yeah, but just a few years ago, the moths and such and such hovering around and flying under the big vapor, you know, lamps. Uh -huh. But yeah. the bats would be getting them. No longer. No. And now that I'm aware and really opening my eyes and looking, no, there's no bugs flying under those street lamps anymore that used to attract them by the hundreds and the bats. So I very well may be a corollary. Uh, I, I, I mean, sure, I could say it to my friends, yeah, them dang chemtrails. But if I wanted to stay scientific, I would have to uh, just weigh out of that until I had more data. But, but really, the corollary is obviously there. Right. I agree. I, I just, I have to repeat this. When we were kids, we'd all go out. What are we going to do? Oh, let's go catch alligator lizards or let's catch garter snakes. We'd go out and if there was a, a pile of boards, you know, 10, 15 boards, there'd be alligator lizards every single time in there. Just turn them over and they'd run. You can catch them. You don't want to catch them by the tail because the tails pop off. And they grow back, but. Uh, really nice animals, and they would tame down if you held them. Okay, and I had a pet for rub a long the time. top yeah, of their you head. Had your hand mealworms. Just yeah, just rub the top of their head, and they calm. They they were really neat pets. These are alligator. For those of you who don't know, look up Western alligator lizards, and they're gone. It just it really man, it just makes me mad to think about that. Well, um, you can flip boards over too, and we would find the voles. You know, the little look like a mouse. Yes, no yes, tail. of course. Yeah. And uh, yeah. no longer, and I still flip over boards. We've got some ponds down by me that I would take my, you know, 80 year old mom to, and we'd hang out. And there's gambusias. We'd be tossing that. We'd bring like breadcrumbs <laughs> just to bring them up. Same with the green sunfish. Both are, are you know, introduced species. Um, but, you know, going down there, the same thing. I'd flip over boards, and that's just the exact same condition that it's always been in for the last, you know, four or five decades. No voles, no voles, no shrews as well. You'd always see the shrews, uh, nothing. And the snakes, being that we had that such a thick biomass at one point, that's really telling there. And, right. I, again, yeah. I don't know when those started to go down because I'm a full-grown man now. I run a, a business and a company, and I don't get to go do as much as I used to, alas. But um, just seeing the insects, because they're everywhere, you know, we don't have the board in the front yard anymore that would collect the alligator list. Well, we never did, but my friends did. Uh, and boring. But uh, so again, I can't really say anything except uh, the bugs are gone. The bugs are gone, Jeff. The birds are gone. You know, those are something that you can notice right. driving down the street, driving your car, looking and, out the window, you know, sitting another in the, thing. the office. Gopher snakes. We'd always see gopher snakes. 
always. And some of them would be six feet long, big, round, and they were, they wouldn't bite. They were nice. Anyhow, cr- crazy. Um, let me finish up with uh, Todd's letter here. We just have four minutes. He brings up something else that's odd. He said, weird thing. We never had coyotes, raccoons, fox, squirrels, or red-tailed hawks in my little neighborhood, but they all reside here now in large numbers. I've seen four cougars, two huge toms, and probably the same year-old or small female. The cops killed one days later. And three bears with two running as a pair. All three were massive two to three hundred pounders, and I saw them from about 30 yards distance. I thought the pair were werewolves. Ha uh-huh. ha. Uh, I hadn't seen a wild bear up until that time. And they were running right at me on a wooded jogging pathway. The cops killed one less than an hour later, too. Darn it. Um, so, there you go. What's the deal with that? They're, I guess, proliferating. Those animals are moving toward more populated areas looking for more food. Yeah, and again, I didn't know why um, why we're seeing the coyotes. We really didn't. We would hear them howl. We never saw them. Uh, I've probably seen a hundred of them. One of them even had a cat in his mouth. And Jeff, I'm going to say this: I've had on two occasions three of those ding dang things come after me. Uh, I jumped up on a fence at one time because they were coming right at me, and they only. Oh, that's like, not good. Uh, my goodness, and they only ran because I pulled my phone out because I was like, nobody's going to believe me. I'm getting attacked by ding-dang coyotes. But I, I, the only time I've shot a gob of them, I got the skins on my wall in my gun room to prove it. But uh, those things, you only see them running with their tail between their legs. But then I came home, I Googled it, and then I Googled some of the video, and they were in uh-huh. their aggressive posture. Never saw the That's aggressive not, posture No, this before. is not, not a good sign. No, this is not normal. You're right. They yeah, would never do and, that. Uh, in the old yeah, days. and those bears, I, I felt sorry for them. They ended up shooting one of them. They just let it go. It was so close to getting away, Jeff. It's like a quarter mile from the big, you know, zone that could have took it right up the gorge, and it would have been safe. So that's just dart bad. it, dart it, take it away, and let it loose. Yeah, you know, I don't get it. I, put it turned on the siren and flashed up high beams in its face, and it would have split. A lot of, unfortunately, not all of them, but a lot of police officers they want to shoot things they just want to shoot things all right last uh, when i note. was young i was dog guy ching gang scooch you name it i that's probably jeff why i remember so much about the birds because give me my wrist rocket and i would go out and we pasted them i'm ashamed of it now and you know we'd skin them or cut the wings off and used them for fly tie and i mean hell you go to jail for that now fortunately but uh yeah but you know use them for a, fishing Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm gonna have a t- fly tire still, even though I can't yeah. see that well. But yeah, but still, and, and again, that's why I probably remember everything so vividly because uh-huh. I was so much out in the field, you know, constantly. Yeah. As soon as I got home, it was either grab the wrist rocket and go try and shoot a bird, or grab the bow and try and go rabbit or pheasant hunting, um, or jump on the motorcycles and head down. You know, best friend Pete had a motorcycle. We just, but it was the same field, the same wetlands, the same, you know, couple thousand. Any, acres, so whatever when, you were when, doing down there, yeah. um, you know, you any were field, to the wildlife. Any field, when I was a kid, any field was an adventure land. Things to do, things to look at, snakes, all kinds of animal life gone. And the last thing I want to mention here real quickly, uh, no birds down here to speak of, but lots of Canada geese. They're seemingly tough i had uh five pairs successfully hatch eggs we had i think i had 20 27 baby geese successfully hatched this year that's that's wow. a record so they're they're pretty tough not so many ducks but canada geese everywhere they eat grass that's all they eat yeah that's why they're delicious that's it somebody said that once all right, we're just about out of time. What do you want to do to wrap this up? Thank you very much, by the way, for coming on and sharing this. Anything you want to add that we missed? 
Oh, yeah, I just remember my old grandpa telling me about seeing the passenger pigeons when he was a kid, and, you know, they were extinct by that time. I'm afraid I'll be telling my little baby Grania and my daughter Fiona the same thing. It's like, yeah, I remember this and that, and for them to never be able to hear 2,000 birds fly over. Wow. How sad. How true. We've lost so much. Uh, Todd, thank you for being out there and for contributing. This has been really good. Thanks very much. Uh yeah, thanks, for, thanks, Jeff, and keep up what you're doing. We all need to know more. Thank you. I will. All right. Good night. Have a good night. Todd Folk, out of Todd Hunter Folk, out of uh, east of Portland, not very east, close by. Yeah, when I was a kid, every we'd go out any field. Let's go find some boards in the field that would be usually stacked up somewhere and turn them over. Snakes, lizards, just. Fence lizards everywhere, uh, all gone. How, how really depressing. I hadn't thought about that for a long time.